welcome to a special two-part edition of Law and Liberty, a Texas Attorney General podcast. During National Human Trafficking Awareness Month, we are giving you all of the information we have on red flags for human trafficking and how Texas is leading the fight against this form of modern day slavery. In today's episode, I am joined by Section Chief Kara Foos Pierce and Assistant Attorney General Brooke Grana Robb, who lead our Human Trafficking Transnational Organized Crimes Section. So I wanted to start out by asking the two of you how long you have been involved in this field and what got you involved. So I became a prosecutor 12 years ago, and I wanted to become a prosecutor because I wanted to help kids. Um, So when I I started out on the federal side, I was an assistant United States attorney in Dallas for 12 years. And after about two years in the office, the United States attorney at the time asked me to take over the human trafficking um, for the office. And at that time, I wasn't really familiar with what human trafficking was or what it wasn't. Um, I had a misconception that it had more to do with human smuggling than it mm-hmm. did having to do with helping kids. And pretty quickly after getting into it, and actually after meeting Brooke and hearing Brooke talk, um, when I was learning about it, um, I knew that that was for me. So I love the human nature of working on these cases. There's a lot of people involved. Um, there are a lot of families involved. And it is, it, the cases are difficult, but at the end of the day, you know, you've taken a dangerous person off the street and you know that you've helped somebody um, hold their head up high and face somebody who hurt them. So that's my primary passion. Well, I became a prosecutor 20 years ago and um, I was always interested in issues of juvenile justice. I was interested in domestic violence as I, and I was interested in child abuse. Mm-hmm. And so about 15 years ago, a position opened that involved um, computers and child issues, uh, internet crimes against children. And I thought that would be a really neat way to fight child abuse. And so I started with that. Um, I then um, was introduced to the concept of human trafficking and really it became my passion. Okay. How did you find out about the concept of human trafficking? So the Dallas County District Attorney's Office has actually been prosecuting um, sex trafficking of children before the sex trafficking was a, was a statute. Um, the Dallas police officers were uh, had realized that there was a problem with runaways and that the solution of returning a runaway to the home and letting the runaway run out the back door before the paperwork could even be completed mm-hmm. wasn't solving the problem at all. So they started a um, high-risk model where they would bring runaways um, meeting certain criterias in for an interview to find out whether and how they'd been commercially exploited. And then they'd file uh, cases with the Dallas District Attorney's Office. Um, So that came to our organized crime division. And so once I saw um, how heinous those offenders were and how vulnerable these victims were, it really combined my interest in family violence my interest in child abuse and my interest in juveniles kind of all together in a perfect match almost. And I wanted to ask you both if there was a particular case or instance that you knew about that was really impactful to you that made you think kind of people need to know about this and know that this is happening. Absolutely. Um, My office, when I uh, worked in downtown Dallas, faced the Greyhound bus station in downtown Dallas. And I used to always make a joke that one day I'm going to be a witness in my own case. I'm going to look out the window and I'm going to see something crazy happening at the Greyhound. And that case will be some guy running with a gun or something and I'll end up with that case. Well, that um, actually didn't quite work out. The first human trafficking case I had was a runaway um, girl who was 15 years old who stole money from her grandmother and took a bus and had a layover in that downtown Dallas Greyhound station. And while she was there, she met a man who was involved in um, the trucking industry and he befriended her, bought her some food and then called another friend and kidnapped her from the street in downtown Dallas in the middle of the day. And, um, the, the facts of the story are bad. Um, she ended up being sexually assaulted by him. He ended up taking her, uh, hitching a ride in a 18 wheeler to a, truck stop outside of Houston, where she was forced to have sex with men in the truck stop for several days before she was recovered. And that really hit home with me because if this can happen in the middle of the day in downtown Dallas, um, this can happen anywhere. And I will say that case um, is unique in the sense that so often trafficking victims are not kidnapped by strangers on the street. In fact, that's, that's the exception, not the rule, the facts of that case, but 
that case really brought home to me how this can happen anywhere. This can happen within eyesight of my office. I literally could look yeah. out my office and see where this occurred. An active prosecutor. Right. And yeah. I just didn't happen to, I mean, I wish I had been looking out of my office at that time, but again, um, so, so that impacted me really profoundly, but I do want to make clear that that is the exception, not the rule. So often people are trafficked by someone that befriends them over a longer period of time, lots of times using the internet. But in this particular case, it was a quick, um, befriending and shoving into a car and, and, you know, led to several days of, of really bad experience for that survivor. So we had had several um, cases, but I guess the first one that um, really made me feel like this was what was for me and really committed me to the cause was um, a kiddo who um, she was probably 15 or 16 at the time she testified. Um, she was facing um, charges as often kids do, not out of the sex acts that she was um, compelled to commit, but because that had led her kind of down a dark path that had ended up with her having some charges of her own to deal with. Mm -hmm. So she's up on the stand um, and she's wearing um, the juvenile um uniform juvenile j jail uniform so she's in a jumpsuit and um what really struck me is that um the attorney wouldn't even remember her name her name was a little bit complicated and the attorney kept saying and making you know making um making variations of it but never actually saying her name correctly and it was one of the ways she was trying to dehumanize her to the jury um and i just felt so sorry for that kiddo up on the stand until the defense attorney took it a little bit too far and she kept doing it. And the, finally the jury started correcting her, correcting the, the defense attorney whenever she would say her name wrong. And I realized that we had achieved the goal and that the jury was seeing the kid as a victim mm -hmm. and as a human and was identifying with her in a way the defense attorney was really trying to shut her aside. And to me that really made my vision of my job to make sure that all of my juries and all of society see this kid as a kid and not as a reject of society or as a throwaway. Yeah, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to add on to that is something that I experience a lot in dealing with survivors, especially younger ones, is they end up defining themselves as I am a prostitute or this is who I am. Mm -hmm. And I always tell them that that's not who they are. That's something that they did. Mm -hmm. And that none of us want to be judged by some, the worst thing that we've ever done. None of us mm -hmm. want to walk around and I don't want to walk around and say, Oh, I'm, I'm Kara. I'm the one who yells at my three-year-olds because I'm grumpy or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that is something. And one thing I will say is I'm always very impressed with juries and how they do see through those kind of tactics and they see the victim as a person mm -hmm. and they don't expect people to be perfect. They understand that you don't have to be perfect to be a victim. And sometimes that's actually contributes to you becoming a victim. So yes. I'm, I'm always really impressed that juries are able to see through some of those tricks. And to recognize a child that's under pressure, immense pressure that no child should face like that. Absolutely. Yep. So another um, thing that I wanted to touch on with you guys is the numbers that we see for trafficking are shocking, to put it bluntly. It's way over the scale that most people would think it is. And we see something like 25 million people worldwide are trafficked at any given moment. I was hoping that you guys could get into some statistics for Texas specifically. Like, what are we looking at real time here in the state? So um, a great thing about working at the Texas AG's office and with our state and federal and local law enforcement partners is we do have access um, and ways to track certain things. Mm -hmm. I will say a caveat at the beginning is we can only track what's reported. Correct. And there's a lot that doesn't get reported for various reasons. So as I'm going over some of the numbers that we have for 2020, um, just keep in mind that those are just, you know, you know that, that's, the best that we can find. Um, I think I that it underrepresents yes. the problem. Um, we asked the Department of Public uh, Safety to run, um, to use internet technology to determine the number of online commercial sex ads that we had in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and even I've been doing this for 10 years and Brooke has been doing it longer than me, we're shocked at the numbers. Uh, during a time in which businesses are down, mm -hmm. most many businesses are struggling and, and, and um, are closed, trafficking flourishing. There were over 1.6 million distinctive online commercial sex ads 
that were posted during 2020. In just one year. In one year, and, and that's for the state of Texas. Within that, maybe even a more startling number, they use certain algorithms um, to determine which ads are likely posting sexual um, services of children. Mm -hmm. And that number was over 25% of that 1.6 million uh, posted suspected children. Um, another number that uh, that's, was startling to me and, and not yet not surprising to me based on my experience was that the average age of uh, a young person to get trafficked for the first time is 15 years old. And something that is uh, startling and disappointing to me about the state of Texas is we are the second worst for the number of reported trafficking cases in the United States. Um, that, that is not something that we should be proud of. That's something we should be ashamed of. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that there's so much demand to purchase sex in the state of Texas is something we really need to work on. But I would also add, although I think second is disgraceful, I do think part of that comes because we are looking and we are finding and we are prosecuting traffickers in a country where there are many states who still aren't finding the kids, who aren't looking for the kids. And so as much as I don't want us to be second, I don't want us to turn a blind eye either. Yes. Um, and so if we are looking, we have to also expect our numbers to be high. And so then hopefully there'll be a curve where we can affect it by prosecuting highly and preventive work and all the other things that we do. Another thing that's very positive is the number of um, charity organizations that support victims in the state of Texas. Yes. That's something that Brooke and I have recently been working on. And it is the number is amazing. It's over. Do we say it was? over 500 mm -hmm. organizations that focus and provide services for um, sex trafficking victims, labor trafficking victims, adults, children. Um, it, so that th there's a lot of encouraging numbers out there as well if we're going to be talking about numbers. Yeah, there are. And um, that's actually a little bit um, ahead. I did want to talk to you guys about steps that we can take for victims and what resources there are for victims of human trafficking. How can they reach out to us or get in touch with someone who can help them not just get out of that situation, but to improve their lives for the future? So there are several different ways to go about that. The most important thing is the National um, Human Trafficking Hotline. Mm -hmm. The human trafficking hotline serves various purposes, but perhaps its most important is having a comprehensive list of victim services providers in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. So if you are a victim or you're working with a victim that needs services, the best way, uh, the best first step is to call the national hotline and um, reach out to them and find out about service providers. They have a lot of information about what services they do provide um, mm -hmm. and, can, and can be a great first step. But also, we would be remiss if we didn't say that if there's an emergency, you should always call 911 because the hotline is not an emergency response system. It's for a, a little bit of a slower response. If you see something that you think needs to be immediately reported, then you have to call 911. Yes. And, and that is something that we really want to encourage the community to participate in. If you see something that doesn't sit right with you, perhaps you see someone who seems extremely submissive and someone else is making decisions for them, or you see um, you, you see something that just doesn't sit right, that, that hotline that I just mentioned is a great place to call and report the information that you do see. But I absolutely agree with Brooke. If you see something urgent, someone assaulting someone, something like that, don't call the hotline because it'll take a little while for law enforcement to respond. Call 911. And going off a little bit what you said, I'd like to get into some of the red flags so people can recognize human trafficking. And it's not just, okay, this is something shady. This very well might be trafficking. I should report it. What should people look out for? So for labor trafficking specifically, um, I think one of the biggest red flags is people who are living where they work. Mm -hmm. um, when people are not free to leave, when they're working excessive hours, when they don't have um, any control at, over, at all over their schedule, um, when they're being transported to and from um, the uh, place of business by their employer, um, that really shows the control and that the person might not have avenues of escape um, mm -hmm. or avenues to uh, make decisions or avenues to choose to or not to work. Um, someone else holding their documents, um, their uh, driver's license or their immigration papers or um, threatening them with immigration process um, could be a sign of, of, of trafficking as well. Um, and then I might also add that um, if you see someone who's really um, not able to speak for themselves, um, they uh, you ask them a question and they defer to someone else, 
Um, they're um, unusually fearful of authority or unusually um, submissive to um, an employer that might also be a sign as well. Noted. Thank you. One other thing that sometimes happens in labor trafficking is they may not live where they work, but they may be transported to and from work. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain industries and businesses that will hire a large group of people and will pay for them to all live together in a, in a house, but they will drive them to and from work and they are free to leave the home otherwise, or, or it's very limited. Those are some other signs that they may be being trafficked as well. And could you give me some examples of industries this is prevalent in? The one that I saw um, the most was domestic servants. Mm -hmm. So, um, where somebody would maybe sponsor someone to come to the United States from another country. Sometimes it might be their country of origin or it might just be another country. Um, and they'll have them come live with them under the guise of them being a housekeeper or nanny. And then they either don't pay them, pay them very little, limit their movements, isolate them. A big part of domestic uh, servant trafficking is isolation. Oftentimes, oftentimes that there could be someone in your neighborhood in this situation and you may see the family out all the time and every once in a while you'll see someone with them. Mm -hmm. um, but that that's how they maintain control. A big thing in, in both sex and labor trafficking is control and coercion. And um, so that that's one of the industries I've seen. What, what about you? Brett? So I've seen it in agriculture where um, people were forced to work um, farms or farm work type of uh, labor um, without being adequately paid or as servants. Um, and I've seen it a lot um, or a decent amount in the restaurant business as well, where um, the employers for all of the employees from a restaurant live together. Um, in fact, they were seen because um, a, a neighbor gave a tip that all of the em employees at the restaurant arrived together and they all left together. And those were the only staff other than the manager at the restaurant. And so that raised some red flags to the community and they got law enforcement involved and, and they were able to find traffickers at the restaurant. That's really good to know. I'm sure a lot of people see things that strike them as a little bit unusual, but they're not sure if it's enough to report. And you can let them know that it's always okay to report that if it's suspected trafficking. Don't call 911 with a suspected trafficking incident, but absolutely report something shady if you see it. Right, because they'll pass it on to law enforcement and law enforcement isn't going to start a trafficking investigation by raiding a restaurant. They're going to use that tip and they're going to um, get some information and start an investigation from there. So um, I think that it's always better to report it than to not report it. Another thing, let's say in a, a restaurant situation, if you have questions, you can try to speak to the employee, not necessarily say, are you being trafficked, but mm -hmm. just start a conversation um, and ask them, oh, where are you living? Or, you know, do you, mm -hmm. do you have family or I don't know, start asking some questions because sometimes people will use that as an opportunity to say something to you. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I know sometimes people are hesitant. They, they say, I don't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get causing anyone to go to jail or get the police in someone's business. I will say this. It is better if your gut tells you something's not right to call the national hotline mm -hmm. and give as much detailed information as you can and just know that that law enforcement is well trained in this and they are not going to ruin someone's life over a false tip. Mm -hmm. But isn't it better to have them look into it than to have then, you know, out of the fear of, oh, what if I accidentally falsely report someone? It won't be viewed as that. Mm -hmm. um, no one will be arrested off of your tip alone. There will be a lot of subsequent investigations. So people, yes. it's better to, if you see something, say something. And um, we went over some of the signs of labor trafficking. Sex trafficking is also very prevalent, especially in Texas, like we touched on earlier. What are some of the red flags of sex trafficking? So sex trafficking, uh, one thing I want to make sure we highlight in this, all forms of trafficking can have victims that are female or male, mm -hmm. adults or children. Um, and that's something to keep in mind because I think lots of times people think of sex trafficking and they think only kids or only females and that is not the case. And in any area to any neighborhood, it doesn't have to be kind of a shadier area. It's anywhere in the state. Absolutely. I, we participated um, in the Dallas area in, um, sex trafficking operations that were at wonderful, nice hotels mm -hmm. and ones that were at not as nice of hotels or motels and, uh, traffickers work out of both of those locations. Um, so you're right. It, it can, it crosses socioeconomic lines as well. Some signs for trafficking, and some of these are more focused on children, but um, mm -hmm. uh, people who run away a lot 
frequent runaways. Those are people that if you come into contact with them through your job or as a friend of your child, that's somebody that, that is at higher risk to be trafficked. Um, if they get, if you notice new tattoos mm-hmm. on someone in your life, ask them about the tattoos. Um, in some instances, pimps, um, uh, will brand or tattoo or label, write their name or write something having to do with commercial sex acts or money Mm -hmm. um, as a way of showing ownership over that person. Um, A lot of um, trafficking survivors and victims will not make eye contact with people for various reasons. They are very um, subtle, you know, submissive in, in public and don't like to interact with people. A lot of the same things for labor trafficking, taking direction from someone else. Yeah. If you encounter someone and you even, let's say you work at a restaurant and you encounter someone and they are an adult and won't answer anything and won't look at you and someone else is telling, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a trafficking victim. It could just be people are in a fight or something, but, you know, disagreement. But those are the kinds of signs because mm-hmm. what traffickers do is they, they mentally and emotionally break down their victim to gain Mm -hmm. control. And with that, you can see a lot of outward signs of that type of behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, If you notice someone has multiple social media accounts, um, maybe a friend or a friend of your child or someone has multiple, check out the social media accounts. If you see a lot of sexually provocative stuff on one or more of them, that could be a red flag. Mm -hmm. Changing in appearance, changing into um, being more sexually provocative can be a sign. Also, knowledge of certain kinds of sex-based terms there's certain it's almost there's almost a language in the sex trafficking world and if you encounter someone it is but but people who are in it know it and so if if you're speaking to someone they start using a bunch of words you don't know what they're talking about Mm -hmm. um that might be a sign you maybe want to ask them what does that mean you know ask a few more questions um Sometimes traffickers will take all the identifying information of their victim and they do that in labor trafficking instances. They also do that for um, children or adults because there's a lot of, if if I, if I control your driver's license or your school ID, I control you. You can't Mm -hmm. get on a bus or get on an airplane or drive a car or there's lots of things you can't do without your ID. So if, if somebody doesn't, you know, they have an ID and they don't have it on them and they say, Oh, so-and-so has it. That could be another red flag. So parents ask a lot um, and teachers sometimes as well as to what might be the signs that you might see in your own child or in a, your child's friend. The um, thing that I would want to make clear is that a lot of this recruitment happens online. Mm-hmm. And so if your child drastically changes their Internet usage or um, how they're using it or where they're using it, um, that could also be a red flag, um, especially when it's coupled with, as Kara said, changes in how they're behaving or or their appearance um, and how they're reacting to things. It's so hard because sometimes that's just a normal teenage. I have teenagers myself. <laughs> sometimes it's just a normal teenager. But when you see that um, that drastic change and the suddenly, you know, outgo- one's outgoing child is now suddenly super secretive um, and only wants to be on their phone in the bathroom or in their room, you know, sometimes that can be a sign that someone who's, is trying to recruit them that you don't want them to be having contact with. That's good to know. And every parent and teacher should know that. Mm-hmm. That's something to look out for. Sure. And it's also important to know if, especially if it is a child, your child or a child that's friends with your child, if all of a sudden they have a bunch of stuff that they didn't have before, uh, extra cell phones, um, fancy purses, that is something that traffickers do to lure in victims. They will often promise money, love, affection, things like that. And sometimes they will give people gifts to get them to trust them and then they'll lure them away and and start exploiting them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know this is a really heavy topic. It's a lot of, there's a lot of darkness in it. There's a lot of seriousness in this. And I wanted to ask both of you who are in it every single day on the front line of this fight, what keeps you motivated to keep going? So I would say um, really what, what I do is so, um, so small compared to what the survivors are doing to try to recover from their victimization and move to a healthy and productive life. Um, that, um, whenever I think about that, my, my part seems so minimal. Um, and that really helps me keep it in perspective. I can do my little job, my few steps, um, but they're moving mountains, um, and they are, um, trying to, Um, recover from something that, as we talked early in the conversation, many people would just say, you don't have choices in life anymore. And 
um, for these survivors to realize that they have choices, that they can make a difference, that they can move forward and recover from this is just is something to be uh, to admire. Definitely. And Kara, how about you? What I focus it on in the job is uh, accepting people for how they are when I first meet them, especially survivors, but really everyone. Um, and what I live for is watching that person go from, you know, a, a bad, dark phase of their life. And these cases take a while to come to fruition and watching them get back in school, um, get healthy, get counseling. Um, have goals and dreams. That's one of the things about, uh, especially the child um, survivors that is the most motivating to me. They still believe the world is a good place. They still believe that they can do things. And so I feel like part of my job is to support that, to be a good role model for them about how um, how adults should treat them, mm-hmm. um, be very respectful, be very supportive. But I love at the end of the case, watching that survivor hold his or her head up high face the person or people that hurt them and, you know, speak their truth and be able to move on. Um, How empowering for them. It is. Well, it's a challenge for me because I really grow to care about these people um, a lot. And some of them, if they want to, I stay in touch with, you know, after cases are over and things. It's so neat watching them get married, get jobs, have babies, um, just this entire second, be great people. Um, And, so that's, that's a big part of my self-care for all this is watching for that. And then the other part is I focus on, I try to leave work at work. It's a little harder right now when work is home, you know, <laughs> yeah. staying home, but I try to, to also just main, you know, keep not to think about it and talk about it all the time. Um, but it is, it is a tough job, but it is in my opinion, the best job there is. Mm-hmm. And no kidding about a tough job. You guys are investigators, prosecutors, you help out victims, you're spreading awareness and training throughout all of Texas, and you're a tight knit team. What do you need for these next steps? What are you looking for that'll be the next push forward for human trafficking unit? Um, there are more resources that are needed. We need um, more people fighting this fight. We need more people trained to fight this fight. We need um, more um, local places for victims to go. We need uh, more people working to help victims. Um, I do think that um, another important step that uh, we have to take in Texas is to find the vulnerable victims that we've missed. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like we've um, really over the 20 years since Texas has enacted trafficking laws, um, we really have uh, done a lot for sex trafficking um, of females. I think we have to find ways to identify and rescue or recover uh, male victims. Absolutely. And I think we have to find labor victims. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say that those are two vulnerable populations that we're just, we're not, we're not finding yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, my challenge, I think, is to try to figure out how to help us um, develop systems that find those vulnerable people who haven't been found yet. That would be wonderful. My most important thing that we can do in the state of Texas is to start attacking um, people who are purchasing sex. Mm -hmm. Trafficking is a multi-billion dollar industry across the world, and um, it is a business. Mm -hmm. People think of it as, oh, it's a crime. It is often fueled by organized crime, and people making decisions are making business decisions because their primary motivation is money. Mm -hmm. The way that you decrease the supply is to attack the demand. And um, a great part about my job is that I get to work um, with the Texas Human Trafficking Task Force. Mm -hmm. And um, part of that work is getting to speak to people who work at nonprofits, people who work in law enforcement, um, federal prosecutors, district attorneys, to talk about the biggest issue. And um, one of our big issues in a a legislative recommendation that the task force is making this year is to raise the penalty for purchasing sex in the state of Texas. Mm. Um, right now it is a misdemeanor right now. Very few people go to jail for purchasing sex. Now it is a felony if, you, if the person that you purchase is a child. Mm. Um, so that that's already a felony and, and is a, you get a substantial punishment, but for now, but the thing with sex buyers is they so often don't care if you're 15 or you're 20. Mm-hmm. And so they almost roll the dice and think, well, if I'm going to get caught, 
purchasing sex, oh, 50, you know, 80% chance that it'll be a misdemeanor. I won't go to jail. I won't lose my job. I won't have to, t- no one will find out about it. I'll just hire a lawyer and go forward. So by making it a felony, um, Texas will be the first in the country for purchasing sex to be a felony. Um, we are the second worst in the country for trafficking. So let's be the first to go after buyers. Um, my hope is, and law enforcement supports me on this, that it may deter some people from purchasing sex. They may think twice um, because then maybe their family would find out, their employer would find out. They, they wouldn't be able to live in the shadows anymore because it's hard to, to get around a felony. Um, so if I could get one thing done in Texas this year for human trafficking, it would be that. I love that. And thank you both so much for being here. We're going to wrap up for this episode today, but I appreciate all of the information. I appreciate your hearts in this fight. You're wonderful people. (laughs) Is there anything that you would like to add in for our viewers before we close out here? I don't think so. I don't think so either. If, if anybody is interested after viewing this, um, you can get on the Texas Attorney General's website. We have it under the initiatives tab. We have more information about trafficking. Um, our section's email address is on there. If you have a question for us, you could email us that way. That's all I can think of. There are hundreds of ways across the state to be involved. And if this is your passion, please find, please find a way to be involved in it. This is just the beginning of the fight. Yeah. Thank you both so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Law and Liberty, a Texas Attorney General podcast. If you haven't already, check out our other installment during National Human Trafficking Awareness Month and find more information about how Texas is leading the fight against human trafficking and how you can get involved at www.texasattorneygeneral.gov. Thanks, y'all.